you know. Hi there, my name is Danny Chifley from the Community Broadcasting Association of Australia. Thank you so much for joining us for our first webinar from 2021, Basics of Community Journalism. Big thanks uh, to our friends and colleagues there at the Community Media Training Organisation uh, for putting together this webinar uh, for us all to go through community journalism, talk about how it empowers broadcasters to share the stories that matter most to their community. Community journalism is one of those things that provides an antidote to the dominance of current media moguls that threaten both the independence of journalism and the voices in our community. And in addition to our good friends at the CMTO for organising everything, they've also roped in two of the greatest doctors you'll ever see, Doctor Who, Doctor Strange, Doctor Octopus. We've got some real doctors in the house right about now. I'm talking Dr. Heather Anderson and Dr. Bridget Backhouse. Now they'll be able to give themselves a far better introduction than I ever can, but Dr. Heather Anderson is a journalism and media studies scholar who investigates the ways media can be used to promote social justice, in particular through community radio and citizens media projects. Uh, Dr. Anderson is a senior lecturer in the School of Humanities, Languages and Social Sciences at Griffith University in Brisbane and was co-designer of the Introduction to Journalism in Community Media course, which you'll be finding out a little bit more about today. Uh, Dr. Bridget Backhouse is a lecturer in the same School of Humanities, Languages and Social Sciences at Griffith University. So much great, Griffith University, such a rich history of support and academia in the realm of the community broadcasting sector. So wonderful to have them there. And her research explores the intersections of voice listening and social change in community radio. Uh, thanks so much to everyone there in the instant message box who is uh, acknowledging the traditional owners of their land. I'd also like to take that time to do so now. Uh, the CBAA offices where I'm broadcasting on are in Gadigal land. So I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. Uh, Michaela has said uh, she's joining us from Darable country. So acknowledge those traditional owners as well and everyone else who is doing so as well. Please feel free to take the time to do so. It's an absolutely wonderful thing. Um, today's session, we've got a lot to get through. Uh, we're going to explore what community journalism means and why it's important. We'll be sharing a bit of advice for community broadcasters who are starting out as community journalists. We're going to have some great sections of audio as examples of what you can do as part of community journalism. The, as well as an introduction to the CMTO Journalism in Community Media course. So the learning won't stop when it hits midday. It's going to keep on going on and on and on. Now, uh, Dr. Anderson and Dr. Backhouse, I'm just going to stop sharing. Uh, I am going to give the floor to both of you. Hey, Heather, how are you going? Hi, Danny. Wonderful to have Lovely you. to see you. I had to show myself, uh, Bridget noted before, the shades of blue, the calming shades of blue yeah. that I've taken on today uh, to uh, sort of assist us through this. Um, please feel free to elaborate on the introductions that I've given you both, but otherwise I am going to shut up and leave it up to you to let us know more about community journalism. Thanks, Danny. Well, um, Bridget and I are actually in offices next to each other, but because of the current um, requirements in Queensland, if we were in the same office, we'd need to have our masks on. So we decided that we would um, operate parallel. I think if I yell loud enough, she'll probably be able to hear me. Uh, <laughs> and we'd also like to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners where we are working. This is uh, um, Yubara and Turrbal people uh, around Brisbane uh, and surrounds uh, recognise, um, pay respects to elders past, present and emerging, and also recognise that sovereignty has never been ceded in this country that we now call Australia. Um, so the way that we're going to do this is I'm going to talk a little bit about community journalism, and then Bridget's going to talk more about the course. And as far as I'm aware, Bridget, can you, are you going to control the PowerPoint? Yes, I'll draw the PowerPoint. And I'll do that annoying click now thing every once in a while. Um, I won't add much more to Danny's introduction. It's very nice to be um, included with Doctor Who. Um, and, and I guess just in terms of from a non-academic perspective, most of my community broadcasting has been here in Brisbane with 4 Z, 
uh, which I wore the T-shirt and now I'm not sitting the right way to see it. But uh, And also um, from about 1991 and then also some great work at uh, WOW FM in Semaphore in Adelaide, which we'll be sharing some of some examples of work from, from there. Uh, Bridget, do you want to give a little bit more of an introduction of yourself before I take over? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, being compared with Doctor Who and... I mean, it, we can't get much better than that, really, can it? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I think Danny pretty much covered it. My community radio experience is also mostly in Brisbane, um, 4EB, 101 Logan FM, and producing The Wire for a couple of years. Um, yeah, and at the moment I'm sort of focusing, my research is focused on community radio and social change, and I'm teaching in journalism, so it's been very exciting to get the opportunity to develop this course and really hone in on what makes community journalism so special. And we're looking forward to sharing that today. Excellent. All right. Well, let's get stuck into it. Um, so I think if we think about community journalism and Bridget, we might just have to click over a couple of slides, I think. Beautiful. Here we go. Um, so the actual concept of community journalism has a very long history. Uh, the term itself is quite recent, uh, but this idea of community journalism is not a new thing. And I think that one of the important things to do first is to pick out this, um, like this word community, uh, which is a, it's a huge concept. It, the term can be problematic, but when we think about community in terms of the phrase community journalism, quite often that's a synonym for local journalism, which it definitely can be. And for, for some, probably for a lot of community broadcasters, the geographic community, the, the geographic location is the focus. So for example, WOW FM in the Western suburbs of Adelaide, it's a station that targets the local community as its key audience. But then we also have non-geographical communities as well, which we call communities of interest. So if we think about say Joy FM in Sydney, which targets the LGBTIQA plus audience um, and those communities as its key audience. So when, as a radio station, you might have a specific geographic community as your target audience, but you might also have um, particular communities of interest. Your target audience, your community of listeners is an important aspect to defining community journalism. And it might also be that your particular radio show targets a community of interest rather than the local um, the local community that you're, that you're actually broadcasting to. So community journalism has traditionally been considered to be quite an idealised form of journalism. We think of it as being the backbone, the back, the backbone of democracy, the, the backbone of community life. But over the years, we've seen mainstream for-profit media come to dominate the choices that are, that are out there for us to consume news, um, multinational news conglomerates that are syndicated across large areas, um, often syndicated nationally, sometimes even internationally. And this has really undermined the capacity of local stories and local voices to make an impact uh, for those, those local voices to be heard. So instead of stories that are important to everyday folks, Journalism more often echoes the narratives of the elite. Uh, government spokespeople and other powerful groups are often privileged as sources. They tend to set the news agenda as a result of this, and this is to the neglect of everyday people. So community journalism pushes back against this. And for me, I feel that the role of community journal journalism is to fill the gaps to provide spaces for communities to be represented, uh, for them to represent themselves and, um, and also to be heard. And um, Bridget, if I can ask you to click the PowerPoint, there's a definition that, um, that you actually highlight 
in one of the module lectures. Community journalism is intimate, caring and personal. It reflects the community and tells its stories and it embraces a leadership role. So this definition captures several dif different aspects of community journalism, um, that it's intimate and personal. As a community journalist, you might even know the people that you're talking to or talking about. Uh, regardless, you're definitely telling stories of your own community. And that really is a leadership role because you're setting the news agenda for your community on your radio station or on your radio show. Um, can you click again, please, Bridget? We talk about this in more detail in the course, but here's a few key points to define community journalism in Australia. So community journalism is accessible. Community journalists are real people talking to other real people uh, in down to, down to earth accessible language. It's people focused. So it's about connection. It's about amplifying voices. And it's also accountable to the community, to the audiences, but also to the people in your stories as well. So at its heart, community journalism really, it's just good journalism. Um, it's, it's what journalism looks like when you take that for-profit model away. It's grassroots reporting for the community, about the community, and it really shouldn't be a radically diff different model to the kinds of journalism that are practised everywhere. But, you know, as many, many of you probably already know, it often is. Uh, can we change? Yeah, thank you. Another aspect of the, the course that we're talking to in this webinar is considering what makes community journalism different to for-profit or mainstream journalism. And as I mentioned before, I think that that main difference is really the way that community journalism fills in the gaps, uh, especially in regards to local coverage, um, to providing in-depth and longer form investigations, uh, coverage of marginalised groups, and the gaps that emerge from the framing of stories in particular ways. So this tends to happen when the same types of sources are relied upon to talk about issues. And, you know, as I already said, uh, this framing comes because a lot of the time uh, mainstream or for-profit journalists are relying on those sources of authority, police, politicians, to set the news agenda. And this repeats those powerful voices, whereas community journalism may interpret these news agendas for a local setting and showcase local voices and local talents to report on those stories. Um, the types of gaps that community journalism aims to fill are really exacerbated in a country as large as Australia, uh, where there's lots, lots of regional and rural um, and remote communities that are quite isolated and unique. So you can imagine that if you lived in Yak and Danda in, in country Victoria and your news is coming from Melbourne, then there's going to be some significant gaps in that coverage. So I'm going to share a couple of examples with you now. Um, and these are projects that I've been directly involved with uh, using an action research approach to both research and make community journalism at the same time. And I'm starting to try and use examples that I have personally been involved in um, in my research and in my presentations, uh, rather than talking about what other people are doing. I think this idea of people talking about their own work and nothing about us without us is really important. So um, it, it may seem like megalomania, like a megalomaniac going, here's the stuff we're doing. But the good news is, is that this is not community journalism that I'm producing. This is um, projects that are encouraging and working with other people to become community journalists. So the first is Radio Seeds, which broadcasts on WOW FM, which I've already mentioned, a small radio station that serves the western suburbs of Adelaide. WOW stands for Way Out West. Radio Seeds is a monthly one-hour radio program that's coordinated and hosted by formerly incarcerated women. Uh, it's part of a grassroots organisation called Seeds of Affinity. 
It's a magazine style program made up of discussions, interviews, pre-recorded content, and, um, and it all focuses on prison and criminal justice issues wrapped around music that's been selected by the Radio Seeds hosts. So we're gonna play a sampler to you. It is four and a half minutes long, but there's lots of different bits and pieces. And I think it gives a really great um, example of the breadth of different types of community journalism that are happening with in this show. Um, and it gives you a break from listening to me as well. So, so let's let's have a listen. Have you done time? Need support getting back into the world? Or just want to get educated? This is Radio Seeds on WOW FM. 3pm on the first Friday of every month. Afternoon listeners, you're listening to Radio Seeds, the show that aims to connect with women in prison, support them on release and explain the prison experience for the wider community. My name's Loretta and I've been out of prison for five months now and I've had the support of my amazing children to help me through. We're going through a lot of healing right now and I talked to my daughter who agreed to share her experiences. The first thing I really thought was knowing where you would be, knowing that you're okay mm. and that you'd be safe in a way. What about the next step? What about when you knew I was heading to court? And... It was different. Not really knowing what to expect. Yeah. But also, in a way, like an eye opener, having a bit more of an understanding of what happened mm. and what you've been through. So then, I guess the next thing was when you would come and visit. How was that for you? The first time going there was I didn't know, I didn't really know what to expect, but it was just going through that whole process. Yeah. And being able to hug you. And it was just hard having having to leave. What advice would you give other young adults or, you know, even young kids going through the things that you've been through with, with me being in jail? What, what advice would you give? What's really helped me is just being able to just be there, just supporting you and going through everything with you. And letting you know that I'm there to support you. Um, I guess just don't give up. You're an inspiration for me and you've really helped me get through one of the hardest times of my life. Discussing this, it's quite an <laughs> emotional journey for all of us. And I yeah. um, just want to say thank you, darling. Hey guys, you listen to Radio Seeds um, from Adelaide Women's Prison. Hope you enjoy everything and enjoy and thank you for all that you're doing. It's brilliant. My name's Julia and you're listening to Radio Seeds, supporting women in prison on WOW FM. We're joined in the studio today by Lisa Carter from Hepatitis SA, who's here to tell us about a peer education project. Thanks for having me here today. Um, so at Hepatitis SA, we have a team of uh, hepatitis C peer educators. Christine talked to Celeste, whose mum has been in and out of jail since she was 12 years old. And just a heads up, that if you're listening in prison and have left a child on the outside, it's quite difficult listening and you might want someone with you as support. She doesn't hold back on how she feels. You have um, dealt with your mum going in and out of prison since you were very young. Can you tell me a little about that? Yeah, so she first went in when I was about 12, I think, um, just for like some minor things. I didn't really understand, I guess at that point, um, that was sort of the first time that I'd ever really experienced stuff like that. So it was all new to me, you know, the visits and um, the phone calls, you know, 10 minutes and, and whatnot. Um, I guess back then it was, it was easier because I thought it didn't matter sort of how long she would always sort of come home. But then obviously as the years got on and she continued to do the things that she continued to do, um, I guess it got harder. I'm Fiona and I'm joined in the studio by our special guest. Michelle is a lecturer and PhD student at Flinders Uni and she's here to talk about her research 
where she used photography to hear about the experiences of people who have left prison. So can you just tell us what Photo Voice is? So Photo Voice is a, a research method um, and what it does is you actually give people a camera and ask them to go out and uh, take a photograph that represents their experiences. That's an incredible array of content and the program's authenticity really derives from the hosts being almost exclusively women of lived prison experience um, or women who've been affected by the criminal justice system in some way or another. So they really are the experts and they do a great job of representing the issues of this particular marginalised group of people. And Radio Seeds really applies a critical lens to criminal justice issues as the radio presenters interrogate each other's understandings of a wide range of issues. You heard there um, discussing issues to do with uh, how, um, how children are affected by uh, their mother's incarcerations, um, the other discussions that weren't included there, uh, roundtable discussions about how to cope with being on home detention. And then they also combine that with a, a wide range of interviews with people that, that you wouldn't necessarily um, hear interviewed. And these discussions encourage a really high level of constructive reflexis, reflexivity on the impact of criminal justice systems. So it really presents prisoners and ex-prisoners in a very different light to the stereotypes of much of the mainstream for-profit media and, um, and helps us to, to really constructively think about those representations. All right, another example, again, from South Australia. This is um, Powerhouse Radio Show. It was a radio project produced by young people of refugee experience in the Adelaide region. Uh, part of a research project uh, that I conducted when I was at University of South Australia. And we used the university's internet radio station to run the project, but then the audio was also made available and picked up by some community radio stations. And the research aimed to investigate how media production can assist young people of refugee background to, um, to settle in Australia. I'm going to play a shorter excerpt from, from Powerhouse Radio, but I just need to give you a little bit of context here. This is one of my favourite um, interviews that a student of mine has done. And um, basically one of, the, one of the students, one of the participants in the project uh, said to me, I've got one of my friends who's still in the refugee camp that we were there and he's been there for a real long time. Can I phone him up and interview him? And I was like, that's incredible. Yes, yes, let's do this. And each of the each of the participants presented their own show. So they had one show each. And um, the quality of the phone call to the young man in the refugee camp was not particularly good. So while we did play bits of it, a lot of the time, um, Obi, the presenter, more talked about it uh, and um, so I'm just going to play this little bit of this is a bit of his show including a little bit of that interview. Did you guys hear about Powerhouse Radio Show? Oh yeah yeah I've heard about it. Everyone is talking about it. What's going on? It's a radio series broadcasting on Unicast during November produced by young outspoken radio stars in Adelaide. What amazed me is everyone is talking about it. It's viral on social media and they haven't broadcasted yet. It's just amazing. I can't wait for them to be on air. Follow them on Facebook, Instagram and WordPress blog. And tune in during November, Mondays and Tuesdays, 7 to 8 p.m. and Sundays, 4 to 6 p.m. Powerhouse Radio Show! Welcome to Powerhouse Radio Show in Powerhouse is run by young outspoken youth. And for the last last episodes, we have had Daniel Kennan talking about youth issues and we have had Lovetta talking about the Welcome to Australia uh, event that happened in the past week. That was Kennan, who was born and raised in Somalia, but currently lives in Canada with a song, Waving Flag, one of the songs that made him famous around the world. And if you follow his stories, you see that he sings uh, about the freedom. He sings about 
uh, what's happening in the world and it's a lovely song waving flag we have about six uh to six to seven refugee camps in southern africa uh that i may not know by names but uh one of them is Duke refugee camp which is in botswana we have another refugee camp in angola we have a refugee camp in zimbabwe in south africa and we have a lot of young people who have been living in refugee camps for quite a long time and these young people have no way to look they have no one to take them because they are just not eligible for humanitarian assistance so our question today is what kind of people are given humanitarian assistance though we see uh, developed countries doing the best they can but in se it seems like they uh, it's a bit of some unfairness in what's happening, but we also managed to have an interview with one of the young people who live in a refugee camp and ask him how he's doing, what he thinks about humanitarian assistance. Oh, my name is uh, Leslie Makanat Gumiwa. Yeah. The young man is 22 years. Oh, 22. Uh, so we are age mates. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we are. We are. Born and raised in Zimbabwe. Yeah. But currently staying in Botswana in a refugee camp called Dukwe Refugee Camp. So, okay. how long have you been living in a refugee camp? Uh, probably it's now eight years. Eight years? Eight years. So, there's a couple of really powerful examples of why community journalism is so important. Um, so for me, I think that community journalism is, is important because it plays a critical role in contributing to meaning making within communities. So by reporting on and sharing stories, you're contributing to a collective sense of the issues that are important. So, so really community journalists are helping to shape community identity. Can we skip forward to the next slide, please, Bridget? Thank you. So according to the Community Media Matters report, these are the key roles that community broadcasters see themselves as contributing to the media landscape. They see themselves as providing alternative sources of local news and information, connecting community members and creating community, and more accurately representing Australia's diversity by covering underreported issues and groups by providing views that are different to what we see in the mainstream media, and also by providing context to the news already covered in the mainstream media. And I think that uh, both of the examples that we heard from do a great job of that last point. And in this way, community journalists see themselves as counterbalancing the mainstream media's depictions of news and current affairs. Okay, so I am going to hand over to Bridget in a moment. Uh, she's going to talk more specifically about the course. Uh, but first, we're both going to share our top tips with you. And I'm going to go big picture. Uh, Bridget wrote her list first, and I just totally agreed with all her points. Uh, and there's a lot of really great practical um, pieces of advice. So rather than repeating ourselves, I'm just going to leave you with this. Be passionate and be curious. Community journalism should be fun or at least rewarding. So obviously, you know, when you're, when you're covering issues that are not pleasant, you might not be having fun, but you should feel like, you should feel satisfied at the end of the day. You should be exploring issues that are of interest and of importance to you. And then my other one is don't stress about what you should and shouldn't do, so long as, you know, as long as it's within the law, of course, you know. So be very concerned about legal implications for your community radio station, but don't be constrained by the ways that other people do journalism. Um, if you are an ex-prisoner, then yes, interview your family about how they coped. If you've got the phone number of a friend who's in a refugee camp, call them for comment. So think big and don't, don't get boxed in by how you think journalism should be done. Uh, so I'm gonna throw over to the next room to Bridget to share her top tips. 
Thanks, Heather. Um, definitely some great tips there. Uh, mine are sort of along a similar vein, but I guess uh, perhaps a little bit more hands-on. Um, my first tip is to always be listening out for stories. So building off a lot of what Heather said when it comes to defining community journalism, your story should come from your community. So just always kind of keep that ticking away in the back of your mind. You know, it might be something you notice when you're taking the dog for a walk or something that comes up when you're chatting to the person at the fruit and veg shop. Um, community journalism is about community stories and the best way to find those stories is to be an active member of your community and just sort of keep an ear out for possible stories while you're doing that. Uh, the next tip is a very practical one and I just thought it was too important not to include uh, and that is to check and double check your equipment. Check it before you leave home, check it before you do any interviews and practice with it to make sure you're comfortable and you can do any basic troubleshooting. Uh, you can do the best interview in the world, Walkley award winning stuff with all the preparation and research, but if it's not recorded, then it's no good for radio. And if it's not recorded, it's going to be a lot more difficult to get quotes for any you know, online or print stories that you might be working on too. So definitely check and double check. The next one is to embrace silence in interviews. Bit of a silence joke there. I can sort of feel Danny panicking that it's a tech issue. But um, silence is very uncomfortable, but it's a really valuable tool when it comes to interviewing. So it does take a bit of practice. It's basically a game of chicken between yourself and your interviewee. People hate silence, so they talk to fill it. So by staying silent instead of immediately launching into your next question, you can sort of subtly encourage your talent to elaborate and fill that si silence, which can be very powerful. Uh, it takes practice and it does take judgment as to whether it's appropriate, but it's a good tool to have in your interview tool belt. Um, another top tip for community journalism is to be critical about the idea of balance. Now, a lot of journalism literature and mainstream journalism talks about the importance of balanced stories, and that's absolutely true to a certain extent. You don't want to, you know, see stories that just push one point of view, but a balanced story doesn't always mean for and against. And we do talk about this a bit more in the course, but for community journalism especially, it's about embracing a range of perspectives to produce a well-rounded story. Um, climate change is a really good example of this. Often in mainstream journalism, you'll see a climate change story that has a scientist or an activist talking about the effects of climate change, and then they'll include a ch climate change denier just to have that sort of opposing view, which isn't always constructive. So what would be more useful in community journalism might be, you know, including different perspectives from different stakeholders. So not just a for and against, just sort of a more well-rounded holistic view. Um, looking, really embracing that complexity and looking for a well-rounded range of perspectives rather than just those opposing sides. Um, and my final one is probably my biggest tip ever. It's do you have anything else to add? And this is such a powerful line, such a powerful question to include at the end of your interviews. And I swear nine times out of 10, the best grabs from the interview will come from this question, which is, slightly disheartening when you've spent ages researching and crafting perfect interview questions, but it really shows how valuable it is to give people space to articulate issues and things they care about in their own words without the constraints of your agenda and your interview questions. So before you wrap up an interview, just ask, is there anything else you'd like to add or anything I've forgotten to ask? Some interviews, interviewees will say, nope, all good, thanks, but some will give you gold. So it's always worth including. Uh, so those are a few top tips. I'd like to spend a bit of time now talking about the CMTO course. So this course consists of five modules. Um, we know that news, the idea of doing news can be quite intimidating, even if you're sort of a seasoned broadcaster. Uh, there is a lot of responsibility associated with engaging in community journalism and doing news. So this course, the Introduction to Journalism and Community Media is exactly that. It's about community journalism and it really sort of gives you a very tailored introduction to journalism for community media specifically. We don't really so much go into, I guess, the nuts and bolts of traditional journalism, um, mainstream reporting, like we don't spend any time on inverted pyramids and traditional news values and things like that. 
we really just focus on the kind of reporting that's relevant to your community and how you can get started as a community journalist. Uh, so as you can see, the course is broken down into five modules that you can work through at your own pace. Uh, the modules are a mix of mini lecture videos presented by Heather and myself uh, with some special guests, as well as some online readings, activities, um, interviews with community journos and experts in the field. And this online self-paced content is also complemented by a series of webinars on different topics with different special guests. So you've had a bit of a teaser of the first module already. To start the course, we really dive a bit deeper into what Heather's been talking about and really get stuck into what community journalism is and how it's different from mainstream journalism. Uh, we take a bit of a look at the history of community journalism and some of the theories that help ground community journalism practice in its broader context. Um, it is not, it's not all theory, don't worry. This module also has a look at um, more practical elements like the CBAA code of practice and how they actually apply to community journalism practice. Um, in this module, we also do some work on critical listening. And listening to news critically is a really important part of community journalism because it can help you to identify the gaps in coverage that you can address. Critical listening encourages you to think about the voices that are missing from the story and whose perspectives are being privileged in news coverage. Often in the mainstream media, there's quite a narrow set of perspectives that get rolled out again and again and again. Uh, but community journalists really have a responsibility to think differently about issues and stories. So that's module one. Module two is where we get stuck into the fun stuff. Not that module one isn't fun. Uh, so we get into the really practical elements of radio journalism. So Heather shares some of her golden rules for writing for radio, which is very different for writing for print. Um, I'm going to put you to work now. Have a bit of a think. Here's an example of a lead. Does anyone have any ideas why it might not work so well for radio? And share your ideas in the chat. It's no fun if it's just Heather and I talking the whole time. We've got to put you to work. Absolutely right. Ian's got it. Very good. So as you can see, this is past tense. It's, I mean, it is past tense, it's quite wordy, it includes a lot of filler words and it's likely to lose the audience. So this lead would be perfectly fine for a print story, but we're talking radio. So if we cut out the filler and rewrote it, we'd come up with something like this. Community journalism school students say that one of their teachers is just too much fun. So it's, <clears throat> excuse me, it's present, it's active, it lends itself to a grab. Uh, so that's a good example of how just a simple rewrite can make your radio script writing a lot more active and a lot more engaging. So this is, oh, Victoria's got a good example there. Excellent. Uh, so this is the kind of thing we practice in this module. We go through these fundamentals of writing for radio. We dive into the nuts and bolts of it. Uh, which is very fundamental skill for community journalism, learning how to write in different ways and connect with different audiences. We also go on to look at the different types of radio news. So by the end of this module, you'll know your packages from your voices and your live copies from your grads. The next module is continuing with some of the practical skills and we start off with interviewing. Now, this is something that a lot of new and aspiring journos get very nervous about, which is understandable. Uh, but in this module, we start from the very beginning. How do you approach a potential interviewee? How do you prepare for the interview? How do you think of questions? What happens if the interview isn't quite going to plan? Uh, you get a chance to practice writing questions and then have a go at conducting an interview with a friend or a family member. So we really step you through the process right from the beginning to hopefully try and take away some of those nerves, not all of them, there'll always be nerves, um, but we sort of really start at the beginning in this module. Uh, then of course we go on to recording audio because if we're talking about radio, if there's no sound, there's no story. So we do spend a bit of time in this module introducing you to some of the recording tools that are available uh, in your own pocket on your phone. 
We talk about recording in person on your smartphone, as well as uh, using the free online tools available to record interviews remotely. Uh, this is quite an action packed module really, because we also then get stuck into editing what you're recording. So we start with Audacity, which some of you might be already familiar with. Uh, it's a free audio editing software. We know that every station has its preferred software that they like to use, um, but we have chosen Audacity because it's free, it's easy to download on your own device. And the good thing about Audacity is once you pick that up, it gives you a good foundation to learn other softwares that might be other software that might be in use at your specific station. Um, so we also have our first assessment item in this module, uh, which is a bit intimidating to some people, but it's an edited interview. So this is a really scaffolded assessment item. So I mentioned earlier in the module, you'll be writing interview questions, then recording an interview, and then editing that interview. That all builds up to the assessment item with you every step of the way. Uh, and we know that assessment is a little bit intimidating, uh, but it's really just an opportunity to test out your new skills and get some expert feedback from the CMTO trainers. So it's definitely a learning exercise, not you know, you are doing this wrong kind of thing. It's um, a really good opportunity to get feedback. So module four, now that you've got your head around the basics, we turn to how you can start to incorporate news and community journalism into your station or show. And the first way to do this is through news bulletins. Doing community news bulletins takes a bit to get your head around because when you think of a news bulletin, you know, a very specific format and even a voice tends to pop into your head. So we spend a bit of time in this module talking about what a community news bulletin might look like. And it doesn't have to be the sort of, it's 11 a.m. and it's time for the news type format. Developing a community news bulletin is really about knowing your audience. It's about thinking about what's happening in your local community and telling the stories that are important in your local area. And this again comes back to those concepts of critical listening and thinking about the voices in your community that might not be served by a mainstream news bulletin. And then thinking about how you can fill that gap. So of course this means that every community news bulletin is going to be quite different, but there are definitely some common approaches and strategies that you can employ um, to use to structure your news bulletin and stories. Um, as you could probably guess, the assessment for this module is to have a go at writing your own news bulletin. And some of the feedback that we got from students was that they actually really enjoyed this assessment item. They didn't think they would, but they did in the end, which is great. So it's a really good opportunity to have a go at the work involved in putting together a news bulletin and to test out if it's something that might work for you or your station. Again, you'll get that expert feedback on your work and you'll come away with a really solid understanding of how to put together a community news bulletin that's really tailored to your listeners. Finally, in the final module, we move on to current affairs and community journalism. And this is really the heart of community journalism, where you get a chance to really get stuck into the stories that are important to your community. So the community radio sector has a really strong track record when it comes to excellence in community current affairs reporting. Examples from all over the country, Heather shared a few from general current affairs shows to programs and stories about specific local issues, even podcasts and radio docos focused on that very specialised in-depth community current affairs reporting. So the exciting thing about community current affairs reporting is that you have the space to really dive into the issues and explore them in a lot of depth. You're not tied to the news of the day or the time constraints of a news bulletin. You can experiment with sound and narrative devices to really craft that immersive audio storytelling experience. So in this module, we really break down community current affairs reporting and talk about how you can get started. So the best place to start is, of course, talking about what exactly we mean by current affairs in community journalism. And there's no way, no better way of doing this than listening to some fantastic examples from around the sector. So this module includes plenty of examples so you can learn from the community current affairs experts themselves. Uh, we then get stuck into, I guess, the process of doing a community current affairs story. 
So we talk about coming up with an idea. We go through some tools that you can use to flesh out your ideas and go from a kind of that's interesting moment to a story that's ready to pitch. So we talk about reactive versus proactive stories and work through some brainstorming exercises to come up with different angles on general stories and then how to proactively find your own stories. So story ideas come from anywhere and everywhere. So like I said in my top tips, you should always have an ear out for potential stories. Uh, but every community has groups and individuals who are potential story and interview sources. They could be formal organisations like local councils or chamber of commerce or environmental groups, or they could be informal like in community, social media pages, meeting places around town, or even that one friend who just knows what's going on everywhere. So these are all really important sources of ideas and also sources of interviews. So you've got your idea, now what? Planning is key when it comes to current affairs. Not everyone will have to pitch their stories to an editor or a station manager you might have your own show and have complete creative freedom uh, but it can always it's quite generally very useful to put together a rough pitch as a bit of a planning tool it sort of sort of forces you to think about what your final story will look like as you get started you can think about your angle think about who you're going to talk to do some homework and see if there's any existing coverage on the issue if there is, it doesn't mean necessarily mean that you can't cover it. Maybe the story needs an update or maybe there are those voices that are silenced or unrepresented in the existing coverage. Review that work critically and think about what's missing and how you can use your community journalism skills to fill those gaps. Uh, thinking through your angle and your sources will also help you determine the final shape of your current affairs piece. Is it a profile or a long, long form interview with someone interesting? Or does the story need more voices? Is it more suited to a package? Or is this a big ambitious project that might be better off as a radio doco or a podcast series? Thinking this through in the beginning will help you be really targeted and strategic about your interviews and who you talk to. Some investigative stories, of course, involve a bit of searching and false starts, but if you've got a good idea of what you need, then it makes looking around a lot easier. Uh, interviews, of course, are not stories on their own, though. You still need a sense of movement and narrative if you want to turn these interviews into a piece of current affairs journalism. So this module also takes you through the process of crafting a narrative using audio of taking your interview grabs and research and creatively using scripting and sound to sort of tie everything together into a cohesive and compelling story. Now, this is of course not a linear or prescriptive process. Everyone has their own approach, but this module gives you a bit of a starting point and some tools to experiment with. Of course, every story is different and should be treated different, differently. This is just a bit of a jumping off point. Uh, the final piece of assessment here again, you could probably guess, is a community current affairs story pitch. So you have to come up with an idea, think of an angle and some potential sources and pitch it to us. This, again, is more of an opportunity to get feedback on a story idea and it builds into the final optional challenge for the course. Take that feedback and actually produce your current affairs story. It's a big challenge. But after completing all five modules, you'll have the skills you need to tackle a current affairs issue that's important to you and your community. And that's the course or a, a very quick overview of it anyway. Um, as you can see, we've tried to design the course to be a really introductory first step into community journalism that gives you a strong understanding of what community journalism is, but also gives you the practical skills and probably more importantly, the confidence to get started on your own. But don't just take it from me. Uh, we've recently had our first cohort of students uh, finish. And while we're still consolidating most of the feedback, this is a, a lovely comment from one of the students. Um, at the risk of blowing our own horns, we got very kind and positive feedback on the lectures, the assessment, the feedback and the wonderful CMTO trainers attached to the course. Um, but I think the best piece of feedback that I've heard has been about what the students plan to do with their new skills. One student was hosting a music show on the weekends and after completing the course, she feels confident enough to introduce some interviews and news into her show, which is fantastic. 
another student has had a podcast idea kind of bubbling away for quite some time and she said that she now feels like she's equipped to give it a proper go and do it justice and that feedback is amazing for us to see and really that's the kind of outcomes that we'd like to see from the course so as Heather said community journalism is a really incredibly important community research a resource and the more we can facilitate that the richer our media landscape will be. Um, so that just about brings us to the end. Hopefully this has been interesting and useful to you. If you'd like to find out more about the course you can check out the CMTO's website or contact the fabulous Maren McDonnell who I think is here. Um, she's the course coordinator so she can answer any sort of enrollment questions and things like that. Um, Otherwise, that is about it. Heather and I are happy to take any questions you have now or you can feel free to shoot us an email here. But I think that about brings us to the end. Um, thank you so much for being here, everyone. Excellent. Thank you so much for that, Maren. I've just hit your, um, allowed you to talk in case you wanted to get onto the microphone. Uh, Raphael had a couple of specific courses there. What is the cost of the course and how long does the course run for? I don't know if your mic is working at the moment. Hello, can you hear me? I can indeed hear you, Mary. Thank you. Hi, very much. <laughs> thank you for having me. Um, yes, yeah, so there's uh, questions that Raphael does there, the cost of the course and how long does the course run for? Are you at liberty to answer those? I surely am. So thank you so much for your questions. Excellent questions. The course runs for uh, five weeks in duration. Uh, and at the moment, the course is free of charge. So get in quick. Shoot me an email, merin at cmto.org.au if you're interested or have any questions. That's M-E-R-R-Y-N at cmto.org.au. I did flash up um, the link that I flashed up before, Merrin, about the Introduction to Journalism in Community Media course. Um, it was sort of, that's the correct information, isn't it? But sort of at the moment, that's the application portal is not open and it's one by which uh, people need to contact you directly? That is correct. That is absolutely correct. So that link there is uh, really good at giving you an overview of the course. But if you have further questions or you're interested in enrolling or you're maybe not able to uh, enroll right now, but it's something you'd like to keep on your radar, please just shoot me an email and I'll be able to take down your contact details. Excellent. And it was noted there that it's uh, the Collier Foundation uh, have provided the funding for the CMTO to be able to run these free community journalism courses. So big thanks to them. Yes, absolutely. Big thank you. Collier Charitable Trust, wonderful stuff. And it's been one of those things here where there's been a few philanthropic organisations who have been awarding grants to the community broadcasting sector uh, in the last little while. And let's uh, certainly hope that that is a trend that keeps on going. Just in case one of our attendees here today is the CEO of a philanthropic organisation. <laughs> I, I know a sector that would love to talk to you. <laughs> Um, I should also note that um, today's session has been recorded and we'll be sending everyone a link to the recording just in case there was anything you missed today. And I'll also gather together a bit of the information uh, that the wonderful oh, doctors so and so the back have been talking about so today. What we'll do, um, oh, interesting question here. Would you consider opening the course to community newspapers? Uh, well, not the broadcast journalism, and print journalism there as well. I'll throw that, open to, I'll throw that question to everyone. Um, I can, I'm not quite sure about the actual practicalities of the CMTO, which would be for Marin to speak to, but the course, it is specifically designed around yes. radio in the sense that we spend a whole module on audio recording, but the actual, um, I mean, the, the more theoretical stuff around community journalism applies to any um, community media. Uh, it, but the assessments, uh, everything is kind of geared around the, being able to write a, 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 a community news bulletin and produce a piece of radio documentary. So the course as it stands would be useful for people who are working in other forms of community <coughs> journalism uh, who might want to get into audio, but it is, it, it is very sort of heavily designed around audio production. Yes, and uh, but obviously, sort of as you state, sort of a few of the the, the bit of the theory 
uh, in regards to community journalism would be applicable to all different sorts of media. Uh, excellent. All right, I'm just checking the Facebook to see if anyone who is viewing this session on Facebook Live has any questions, not seeing anything there at the moment. Um, if anyone else here in our wonderful audience has any questions they'd like to ask now, please feel free to uh, put those into the chat box now. Um, uh, I'd love to see those. Uh, Jordy sort of said that we could make a pitch to the Collier Foundation in regards to another module for print and online uh, journalism. So uh, that's wonderful to have that there. Um, as stated, if there's any questions that sort of um, you think about them sort of while you're laying in bed tonight, um, please feel free to get in touch with Marin at the CMTO or anyone there at the CMTO as well as Bridget and Heather. On behalf of the Community Broadcasting Association of Australia and the Community Media Training Organisation, CMTO, I hope you don't mind speaking on your behalf. Don't worry, it's for a good thing. It's to give a huge thanks to both Dr. Heather Anderson and Dr. Bridget Backhouse from Griffith University for taking part in today's session. We are truly, truly blessed that we can call upon such knowledge uh, when it comes to such important topics Community journalism is not something that's going away anytime soon. Don't worry, we'll be revisiting this again and again and again. Um, my name has been Danny Shipley from the Community Broadcasting Association of Australia. In addition to thanking Heather and Bridget, I've also got to thank my wonderful colleague at the Community Media Training Organisation, Michaela Ford, for her patience with dealing with me. All of <laughs> 24 hours a day, it seems. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. I've just stopped the live stream there on Facebook. I will be stopping the recording uh, now and uh, making it available.